Hello and welcome to Martian Driving Podcast 166. My name is Terry Frost and this time I have a guest, uh, quite an unusual guest because it's a skeleton and I shit you not, uh, welcome to the channel Nigel Honeybone. Hello, good afternoon and welcome Terry, how are you? I'm doing fine, yeah, I'm, I'm dodging the rona like everybody else and of course you being a skeleton don't have to worry about it quite so much, but uh, yeah, we're all looking after ourselves and looking after each other. No, uh, General Grievous is probably very beefy. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I, I have no lungs to worry about, but I am concerned about my friends as well, so uh, yeah. take care of yourself. Absolutely. Follow the science, wear a mask, and stay away from coughing people. <laughs> coughing people? Are you talking about me? No, I'm not talking about you. Coughing with a G. I would never dare oh. kind of um, diss people of the skeletal persuasion. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, uh, yes, hello. Uh, uh, how can I help you? Just tell us a little bit about yourself <laughs> and about your wonderfulness and uh, what you've been doing since, is it 2008? Oh, yes, 2007 in March is when we started doing the Schlocky Horror Picture Show, and that was on TVS in Sydney. Uh, yep. uh, they uh, needed a, um, they wanted a deadly earnest sort of presenter, and yep. uh, so uh, I was uh, brought on board by Garfield Barnard uh, to host the Schlocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, I have been in the industry for quite a while, uh, so uh, that's why I was chosen. Absolutely, and you've won a Rondo Award, I believe, and also, uh, from what I understand, a Horror Host Hall of Fame Award. That's correct. Uh, back in March last year, uh, I was presented with the uh, Horror, or I was inducted into the Horror Host Hall of Fame. Um, uh, I I do have American American fans. Mm -hmm. uh, I am seen on a couple. My show is seen on a couple of different uh, American websites. Uh, the Vortex and the Monster Channel are both twenty four seven horror hosts and and public domain horror films. It's uh, fascinating if you like that sort of stuff. And we all do, of course. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's good. To, so you you know you do you talk. You do the public domain movie so you don't run into um, problems with copyright and uh, just, kind of, just kind of steer people towards the good stuff. Well, we try to, and we also try to warn people against the schlocky stuff as well. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who like this sort of stuff, and, and I present it to them for some unexplicable reason. Well, it keeps them off the streets and away from drugs, so it's not too bad. <laughs> I'm unsure about the drugs thing, but yes, no, no, I, I agree with you completely. Keep off the street at this time. Yeah, and um, if you if you have to take drugs, get somebody from Uber to deliver them because apparently that happened here in Melbourne. They had somebody delivering <laughs> little packages from one address to a whole bunch of different addresses around Melbourne, and the guy who <laughs> and the Uber driver took one of the packages to the coppers, and it turned out to be drugs, and so they did an enormous drug bust because they basically got knocked by an Uber driver. Well. It, 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 You've got to be careful. It's a bit silly using a a, a taxi to deliver certain things like that. No. Absolutely. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we did, of course. So back back on it, please. But um, how's Sydney looking with uh, the pandemic and everything? You guys aren't in the severe lockdown we are, where we've got to wear masks and we've kind of um, walled into Melbourne. It's kind of like an umbrella corporation situation here at the moment where uh you've got to keep the zombies in so if you go if you drive outside melbourne and go down to geelong there's a roadblock with the with the police and the army asking you why you're traveling army gee yeah. whiz um yeah I, I don't know what's happening um yes uh sydney is not under such a lockdown as victoria is as melbourne is mm. but uh we're still being careful you know there's uh, I'd say when I go out shopping, there's a good 70% of people wear, still wearing masks. They're, people are they're being careful here. Yeah. But uh, it, oh, I, I, I hope everybody and all my friends are okay in Melbourne. Yeah, they, they seem to be. I mean, I'm talking to a lot of um, fans, and of course we're both science fiction fans. We've known each other for a long time in various ways. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and people are looking after themselves and they're steering people towards where you can get masks and 
where you can get tested and things like that. There's a lot of drive-through testing out this way at the moment, which is kind of fun because I'm always tempted. We've done it twice uh, now, once for myself and once for my wife, Sally, and I'm always tempted to order fries when they come up because you drive into this place and somebody comes to your car window. So you got this temptation oh, okay. to do the McDonald's thing where you order a Big Mac and fries. But uh, they're very polite, very professional. We're getting results in quickly, and it's all going well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of low-key pandemic compared to the ones you get in movies like Contagion and other things like that. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, there's, I, I remember when the, the pandemic first started, I was looking at uh, films like The Omega Man uh, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, it, it, so there's, there's a lot of films out there that deal with pandemics. Mm. Yeah, nobody's looking for a spider monkey this time, the way that we're in outbreak. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting time we live in. We live in very science fictional times. So um, what have you been watching lately? That's always the thing. I'll, I'll go into what I've been watching a little bit later. But what have oh, you been sure. watching lately? Uh, I know you've been binging a bit. Staying out so you don't get the cold around your bones. But, uh, yeah, what have you been watching? <laughs> well, there's so much good science fiction and horror being made by American television nowadays. Mm. It's very difficult to keep up. Uh, for instance, I only just recently saw Love, Death and Robots. Oh, yeah. Uh, the anthology series, uh, animated anthology series. That was fascinating. I, it's one of my favourites now. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to the second season of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I I'm also uh, watching old shows that I've never saw before, or, or I, I, I only saw a couple of episodes. For instance, on YouTube, there's the entire series of um, the rivals of Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that's uh, great! From the I'll... early '70s. Yeah, where they get all the other detectives from that era that were written up. Uh, I've got a copy of that somewhere on on disc that it did get released on discs. But they've got all sorts of really weird 19th century detectives in there. It has, and a great cast as well, as you can imagine. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, I've been watching other things as well, of course, keeping up with Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily a big fan of Star Trek, but I feel it's my job to <laughs> keep up with it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Discovery was okay, yeah, uh, but a bit too soap opera-ish for me. Uh, Picard was a huge improvement on that. At least it was more linear. You know, yeah. there was a, a mission to be accomplished. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the new Star Trek, the, uh, the the Adventures of Captain Pike or whatever it's called. Uh, yeah. uh, they promised that it's going to be a, the episodes are going to be more self-contained. Cool. Um, you know, no complicated story arcs so well, also, I'm CBS, to that too. yeah cbs on demand are releasing them one a week because they're still stuck in that 20th century headspace and so if they do <laughs> something a bit more episodic you don't have that kind of thing where somebody watches an episode and they've got to wait for the plot to continue seven days later no, at least uh, yeah some series you know at least they release like the first five episodes or whatever mm. if not the entire series altogether um so, uh, but yeah, you're right. Some television stations are still stuck in that mindset. They uh, they, they still think about ratings. Yeah, which is <laughs> which is such an odd concept these days. I mean, uh, I know that uh, Netflix never release how much money things make f because it's very hard to determine from a, a subscription service. But they are starting to release the most popular um, original movies they're doing. Um, in, yep. in all of the Netflix history, plus on a yearly basis. So they're kind of starting to give back a little bit so people know how successful certain works are. So they're just starting to do that, but it's a very different business model and a very, very different headspace. Hmm. And, uh, and we were talking about public domain, mm -hmm. public domain films as well. Do, do Netflix also carry those things? films as well or? no they don't they tend to um go with the commercial stuff the place you want to go to for that is um tubi tv tubi tv.com they've got uh, a tubi, whole bunch yep, yeah heard. they've got a whole bunch of streaming stuff there and they do a lot of public domain stuff and a lot of stuff that's very kind of marginal things like day of the animals they're doing 
uh, and yep. and a whole bunch of the uh, things that you do as well, the old Sherlock Holmes stuff. But of course, <laughs> you'd be a better avenue for that because you add context to a lot of the things. But uh, <laughs> I but, tried to anyway. Yeah, but there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on there, and there's some interesting things on there that uh, maybe can't be accessed. They throw in occasional commercials just to keep um, going, but they're yep. never intrusive. And, and I've watched whole movies without a commercial. I watched a couple of other ones with maybe one or two 20 second commercials in it. So they're really not um, a big thing. I'm a big fan of them because I can dip in there and just watch something really shitty and schlocky. And they've got really interesting stuff like all of the Rudy Ray Moore movies are on there. Uh, which ones? The Rudy Ray Moore movies, you know, the Dolomite oh. and all that kind of stuff. Yes, absolutely. So all of that kind of stuff's uh, on there. A bit of black exploitation, uh, lots and lots of horror. A few dramas, uh, a few family-friendly things of, of kind of low production value, but uh, yeah, they're, mm. they're kind of they're kind of interesting and uh, cool to watch. And the lovely thing about it is, apart from what you're paying for your internet connection, you're not paying for anything else to for that particular service, which makes it really nice. Uh, I also go to uh, the Internet Archive or mm. archive.org. Yeah, it's a great place for public domain films. So that you, you can usually find, if it's in the public domain, the best quality copy can be found on the Internet Archive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, of course, they have thousands of films in their library as well as lots and lots of black and white TV shows, yeah. um, not to mention uh, industrial films and educational films from the past as yeah, well. Yeah, and a lot of stock footage and things that are available too. I really should access some of those for the YouTube channel. <laughs> no, they, they've been great. And also because we deal with public domain films, mm -hmm. We get our Creative Commons information through Internet Archive yeah. as well, so just to make sure we don't step on anybody's toes. It was really weird because I did um, Cyrano de Bergerac. I talked about it uh, on a previous YouTube video, and some bottom yeah, feeder yeah. from Europe hit me with a copyright strike on it. Um, yes, I remember that. Uh, yeah, the, the Netherlands, you said they were from. Yeah, they were, they were really weird, and I, I kind of looked up the company, and the company basically is there to protect the intellectual property of somebody. But as far as I know, Cyrano de Bergerac was public domain, but I wasn't going to argue with them because they've got more clout with YouTube than I have. So what I did was I, I, took, I kept the audio. I took out the video and just put in, like, stills. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the best thing you can do. Yeah, and it worked and because it didn't trigger the strike. <laughs> and also, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't want to step on anybody's toes with this shit. I want to point people to the good stuff. And Cyrano de Bergerac, you know, Academy Award winning performance, fantastic little movie. Um, I wanted to, people to watch it. So in a sense, I'm, I'm promoting the thing for whoever. And, uh, yeah, and, there, and they're not cutting me any other way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, there, there are things that uh, I hear that people can do. You know, you know it's parody or it's... Mm. Um, documentary purposes, educational purposes, and that, that usually gets you around those little things. I mean, it is um, you are only just showing a, a clip of a few seconds after it. Yeah, well, I did a little more than a few seconds in one case because I wanted to get the entire short speech there, but uh, maybe I kind of overstepped a boundary there. But it's, that's one of those things with, uh, with any kind of content creation, you're on a learning curve. Well, that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Plan 9 from Outer Space was mm. in the public domain for a very long time, but it uh, disappeared from the public domain in 1995 when Tim Burton's Ed Wood came out. Uh, now it's back in the public domain after 20 cool. years. But uh, I, I'm just, I have no idea why it was removed from the public domain in the first place. Um, uh, the, big so, player, uh, the big players tend to predict their intellectual property and they can they can kind of pressure people about tangential things to that intellectual property a lot and oh, and yeah. so then yeah man that so stu big studios aren't necessarily the friends of small youtubers who are, are there basically to help promote their shit anyway so there's there's a um a little bit of a an issue there but i think it'll work out eventually i think that as youtube becomes a more prominent platform um and, and of course the th things that you do on, on commercial on um community tv i think that, that they really need to get a lot more respect there because what they're doing is basically touting for these content providers and uh and in a sense they should uh cut them a little bit of slack it's true well, you'd think, and a lot of them do, I, I, I guess, okay. because you see so much material on YouTube anyway that's not being stopped yeah. or blocked. Um, we have had some problems with public domain uh, 
sloppy horror as well. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my producers, my technical producer, Tim Newsom, is also a musician. Okay. And he's very careful about copyright and making sure we don't use anybody's material wrongly. Yeah. Um, the John Sayles film, Brother from Another Planet, was okay. uh, in the public domain for a while. Uh, we made an episode and we were ready to screen it when it dropped out of the public domain. Ouch. So uh, I actually contacted John Sayles through his website mm-hmm. and uh, corresponded with him. And he said that it was being remastered by a university at the time. Right. And uh, But he gave us permission to screen the film anyway. Uh, just as long as we didn't screen a, a Blu-ray edition or something like that. But you know, the filmmakers, from John Sale to to the most uh, small independent filmmakers, have been very, very helpful in allowing us to screen their stuff. I think it's it's more of giving oxygen to their product in a sense. So the creators well, themselves are very into that, but the um, the accountants and the bean counters and the corporates are the ones that they get a bit precious about that sort of thing. It also helps if I, I say that it's for community TV and mm. um, uh, we have no budget. Um, so And people understand it. Um, I, I like <laughs> Sales' work too, so the fact that he, he did the right thing by you was kind of nice and makes me glad I like his work. Well, I, uh, and I already like his work a mm. great deal. Uh, a big fan of his from from writing... You know, for Roger Corman, that'll be on the stars, and, and, and Piranha, with Piranha, and I think he wrote Alligator as well. Yeah, he did, which is a great little movie. I'm, I'm really fond of Alligator. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Robert Forster coming back again after um, doing Medium Cool and and dropping out and doing some TV for a while, and then he comes back with that really cool um, detective <laughs> role, which is, which is, I, I really like. I like the fact that he's taken making fun of himself and playing it light yeah. and. Uh, yeah, I've seen so many things with him in it. Um, in the last few years of his life, he really did have a career resurgence after Jackie Brown. Um, we had a few people die recently too. Let's talk about dead people because obviously you being a skeleton, you've got a personal <laughs> interest in this. Um, oh, well, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, and you, you also have your popular obituaries every year as well. And of course, yeah. no Oscars, there was no obituary to work Yeah, Yeah, um, the obituary thing is really weird because I did some in 2018 – and it was crazy successful. I got something like a quarter of a million hits on YouTube with <laughs> that obituary. And I've tried it every half year since then. And, you know, crickets. <laughs> Absolute crickets. Ah. And it annoys me. I don't know what triggered on the algorithm, but I got this enormous <laughs> surge of interest. And I thought, oh, this is going to go well. You know, when I can monetize, I'm going to start making all the big YouTube bucks. And it never happened. Even though I, I've actually, the quality of the more recent ones, and the way I've kind of presented them is so much better than the one I did in 2018. In spite of that, it just doesn't grab it. It's a weird platform in some ways. Well, there's controversy every year um, at the Oscars obituaries. Mm. They often uh, leave people out um, yeah. uh, or d- 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 people pass away between the time they've done the editing and the show is presented. I've noticed that as well. Um, yeah, there's also that thing where people people on YouTube, uh, on Twitter in particular, will go, why wasn't that person mentioned? And you go, well, you know, they spent 40 years of their life doing television, not movies. And just because you know them, it doesn't mean they go on the Oscars. Um, but, uh, yes, you mentioned people passing away recently. John Saxon, yeah. uh, another Roger Corman actor. Well, I, I know him from Roger Corman films. Yeah. That'll be on the start. Ed um, DeBattle will be on the yeah. stars. He also did um, Queen of Blood. Oh, did you remember that one? As he was well? in Queen that. of Blood. He was in Enter the Dragon, of course. And then he did those two things for Roddenberry, um, Planet Earth and Earth 2, I think it was. Um, yeah, there was um, Earth 2 and – no, sorry, Genesis 2 was the first yeah. one, and then there was Planet Earth. That was the yeah. follow-up. Earth 2 was the um, one with Alex Cord, which had exactly the same plot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly the same character names mm. as well. So yeah, um, that was a weird thing. It was like you kept doing these different um, pilots for something that really didn't take, and then you use the main character named Dylan Hunt for Andromeda. Oh, as really? Well. Yeah, it's a it's a weird <laughs> thing. Like he had, th- you know, it's like Roddenberry had four ideas, <laughs> and um, yeah. one of them was crazy <laughs> successful, as we know, and the rest were kind of meh. 
John Saxon did a whole bunch of things. He was in an episode of The Fantastic Journey, 1977, which is that cult TV show about people in the Bermuda Triangle traveling to different time zones, which also had Ian uh, McShane in it, which is kind of cool. Right? It was yep. so long ago. I mean, I, 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 I really discovered Ian, Ian McShane in um, Deadwood. Yeah. No, Ian McShane uh, was, was definitely in that because I've got the discs. Uh, they were only like... 12 or 13 episodes released, and uh, and it was released recently as a box set. So I picked it up, and sure enough, Ian McShane's in the first episode. Oh, wild. No, I, I, oh, it's been such a long time since I saw those shows. Uh, and It's not good. to be. It's not a great series, no. although it does have some interesting people in it, of course. Roddy McDowell yeah. turned up in the last few episodes. Yeah, he kind of picked uh, it. He lifted it a lot because everybody before that was kind of like – those blandly good-looking 70s actors who were kind of okay actors but weren't fantastically good? Well, yeah, uh, interesting television character actors, mm. you know, familiar faces. Yeah, familiar faces. So there were, there were a lot of those turned up in there. We also lost Olivia de Havilland at 104. She was uh, living in France, lived to be 104. Uh, actually, yesterday I was watching Amazing. a movie of hers while she was dying which was her worst movie and a genre film as well, which was The Swarm, the Irwin Allen uh, <laughs> bee attack movie, which has got some really great actors in it. It's got, like, Richard Widmark in it. It's got Michael Caine. It's got Henry Fonda. It's got uh, Fred McMurray. It's got Ben Johnson. It's got all sorts of people in it. It's really a weird movie. That really is what Irwin Allen became famous for. Uh, uh, of course, the Poseidon Adventure had some great actors in it. Then Towering Inferno had such uh, an amazing ensemble cast. Yeah. And he's tried to do that ever since, or he tried to do that after. Um, did you ever see his two-part television presentation of Alice in Wonderland? No. Is it bad? Uh, oh, it, it Yes. Good. Yeah, not very good. Yeah. You know, blue screen, studio bound, but a, an incredible cast. It was just like every actor who was unemployed during those two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's what happens in The Swarm. Uh, There's this weird thing where the older actors, Olivia de Havilland, Ben Johnson and Fred McMurray, they're playing a love triangle of, of people waiting for death. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so they all get on a train to be evacuated out of the town because the bees are about to attack. And the bees attack the train and it gets smashed up and they die. And just in the middle of the movie. It, you know, it's like, oh, we don't need these actors anymore. Let's put them in a train crash and have all of these beloved aged actor actors um, be betrayed by stuntmen falling out of glass windows on a tumbling train. And that's what uh. they do. <laughs> um, it, it's a really weird movie. Um, and uh, Michael Caine is so miscast. And I've seen two bad Michael Caine movies lately. I saw that and Peeper, the um, private eye movie set in the 1940s in Los Angeles starring Michael Caine as a private eye with Natalie Wood. And that Peeper. is crazy bad. No, I just don't recall that one, but it doesn't surprise me. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't surprise me hearing Michael Caine's name, though. Um, mm. During, Especially during the uh, 80s and 90s, he was just, doing anything that was put in front of him. Um, he was cashing he checks. He had gambling debt. No, no, the, what happened was <laughs> he had financial advisors, as, as indeed all famous actors do, who basically ripped off all his money and lost him all his money, so he had to go scrambling to keep, um, keep himself in the style to which he was accustomed. So he just took everything. He, he did those jaw, that Jaws sequel. He did a whole bunch of other things. He did a lot of shit in those days and then yeah. kind of had a resurgence with things like, uh, I think it's Cider House Rules, and people went, yeah, Michael Caine can act. Let's um, put him in some good character roles. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, what he did do The Man Who Will Be King in about 75, which was quality. Yeah. But um, and he after had a that, job for as long as he lived, as long as Christopher Nolan's around. Yeah, Christopher Nolan seems <laughs> to put him in everything. I mean, as long as he's got a pulse. I wouldn't be surprised if Christopher Nolan does a um, Peter Cushing on him when he croaks. <laughs> and does like a, a computer generated Michael Caine just to chuck him in there as an older, wiser kind of character. <laughs> we'll get Michael Myers to do the voice. Well, yeah, that's it. Or, or just uh, uh, get Statham to do the voice. <laughs> uh, yeah. Get someone with the authentic accent so you get Statham because Bob Hoskins isn't around anymore, so you get Statham to do the voice for Michael Caine. 
There's yeah. um so there's lots of lots of people. Uh, it's interesting just watching the people you've forgotten about who died, which is always a weird thing. You go, oh, did that character actor die? And did that old jazz singer you like die? There's a um, it's a yeah. fascinating thing. One of the things I wanted to do though with the obituaries I'm doing on the YouTube channel is I didn't want to make the YouTube channel only about that because I could I could basically do a, like which famous person died this week thing and and probably make it makes a success as a YouTube channel doing that. But I really wanted the, to kind of go back to my roots, which is putting people onto the good stuff. And so I'm doing a lot of that, and I'm trying to find weird and obscure movies that uh, are still accessible, and, and things are accessible. There, um, I had to do, for the radio gig, we did Bells Are Ringing, the musical with Dean Martin and Judy Holiday in it from about 1960. And I couldn't yep. find a copy of it anywhere else except renting it on YouTube. And I paid like five bucks for it and rented a, a copy I could watch on YouTube. So um, a lot of things are available now, and you can pay not too much money, a cup of coffee or two worth of money well, and, and access them, yeah. Uh, now, uh, and um, what was the, the film quality like? Was it DVD sort of? It was. It was, it was high quality. quality, yeah. It was up there. Uh, it was 1080. It was high, high definition at least. And so oh, I was okay, kind of good. happy with that. Uh, it looked good. It was a good solid print. Anything I think that uh, people rent uh, on YouTube, the quality is good, but it's just uh, a way to make things accessible but not expensive. So if people don't want to own physical copies, and I'm a big fan of physical copies, I've got a room full of the bloody things. But, oh, um, no, it, very important to me too. Uh, yeah. Subtitles, special features, that's the reason why DVDs exist as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, DVDs and Blu-rays. I mean, I've got uh, the Criterion Blu-ray of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. I got it quite cheaply. There was a sale on uh, a little while ago, so I watched it last week. And they've actually got two discs. One's got the theatrical version of it, which is in Cinerama, so it's incredibly widescreen <laughs> wrap around kind of movie and then they've got an extended version where they found other scenes that were cut and they spliced them in the um the color grading on those bits isn't quite as good but they throw in a little yeah. bit little bits of extra thing there's an extra scene with buster keaton in it he gets one scene in the original theatrical uh, print uh, yeah uh, w were these taken from the the the, the television uh, print. Uh, I uh, believe the television version had extra scenes. It that may have. In America. It may have. I'm not sure. But one way or the other, uh, I don't think it was a, a totally necessary to have it. But it was nice to see that there were a couple of little character actors who were in there <laughs> who got a couple of extra little bits. And that was kind of nice to see. I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed watching the extended version of that. And it's a crazy movie too. Uh, it's a long movie. It's got an intermission. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a mad car chase to find a treasure that a dying criminal tells a bunch of people on a, a road in the desert and everybody goes mad trying to scramble to try to find this treasure down on the That's coast. It. And um, One of the first best treasure hunt films ever. Yeah, uh, Spencer Tracy plays a cop chasing them and he's got an interesting arc there. And the interesting thing is you get right to the intermission. There's an intermission about 60% into the movie. And just before the intermission, they do something really magical with the movie which is they cut between, in a two-minute period, they cut between eight different subplots of the movie to see what everybody is doing. And no movie would try that. No, no, no movie would have eight subplots in a, in a modern movie and cut between them so readily and keep the audience there too. It really is a masterful piece of filmmaking, just that, eight, that couple of minutes there. And other attempts at treasure hunt films uh, have not been su as successful. And, yes, a mad, 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 mad world yep. is, is definitely the, uh, what people aim for. It's a gold standard, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, the Zucker Brothers made a film called Rat Race. I which saw was that. another treasure hunt film. That's got John Cleese in it, amongst other people, and uh, Rowan Atkinson, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, again, an amazing yeah. cast, Rowan Atkinson yeah. to Whoopi Goldberg. Mm. Uh, and uh, many in between. But um, uh, uh, except for the last 10 minutes, which is completely <laughs> lame and ruined the yeah. film, uh, the, the, the editing and uh, the, uh, uh, and again, keeping so many different storylines rolling worked really well in Rat Race. Yeah. So, yeah, as I said, it, 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 it's a, it takes a while to get going. It's got a great middle bit, and the last 10 minutes is really lame. But... If it's on TV, watch Rat Race. 
Absolutely. And I've got another recommendation too. I'm go- Let's see if you can guess what movie this is just from the sound bite I'm going to give you. Because I've got this sound. <laughs> okay. I've got this soundboard now, and I can play with it. Ready for this one? Arabunta. Ready? I'll do it again for you. Arabunta. Terrace Bulba? No, hang on. I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you a longer clip. I've got another clip of this one. Ready? Okay. Marabunta. Soldier ants. Billions and billions of them on the march. How's that? Oh, okay. Was that uh, the Naked Jungle? It was the Naked Jungle. It was William Conrad in <laughs> the Naked Jungle. I've got one more sound clip of that. That is a great movie of Charlton Heston versus all the ants. But um, I'll give you the other sound clip. I'll get you ready. Yep, ready? Well, engine, you're up against a monster 20 miles long and 2 miles wide, 40 square miles of agonizing death. You can't stop it. I love those clips. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> no, yeah. I, I could. I, may I hear that again? The description. It was, yep. uh, it's I brilliant. don't recognise it. Forty square miles of agonising death. Line engine, you're <laughs> up against a monster twenty miles long and two miles wide. Forty square miles of agonising death. You can't stop it. It's brilliant. Wow! No, I, no, I, I, you've got me there. What was that from? That was um, the Naked Jungle. Oh, that was the Naked Jungle again. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, there's just, I mean, all the good lines <laughs> are William Conrad's <laughs> lines in that movie, <laughs> and uh, and then of course you've got Eleanor Parker playing the the kind of um, wife that comes to the jungle to meet her husband for the first time, and um, then you get Charlton Heston, Heston being kind of athletic. And beating the ants who are eating his plantation away in Central America, in South America, <laughs> it's just a great movie to watch. Uh, it's, it's one of those kind of nineteen fifties action flicks that you kind of watch as a kid and you know and love. Yeah, um, um, I've got a, a friend currently working on a documentary, an eco horror documentary, which focuses on films like that um, and all sorts of other. You know, insects, animals going crazy. Yeah, Day of the Animals. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Day of the Animals and uh, Frogs, <laughs> which has got Ray Frogs Milland and one. Sam Elliott in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sam Elliott, what yeah. a guy. Absolutely. Hey, I've got another clip for you if you want it. Uh, yeah, I'm listening. Ready? You ready? Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. <laughs> <laughs> Another child nesting clip, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Planet of the Apes. I mean, nothing, nothing in the recent ones was anywhere near as good as that moment. <laughs> no, yeah, and 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 Charlton Heston. Yeah, yeah despite his, his later associations with the NRA, yeah, um, he was a real driving force for Hollywood science fiction back he in was. the sixties. I mean, was, yeah. uh, he was the one that wanted to get soil and green off. Mm. The ground. He read the book on a plane and decided he wanted to make a film immediately. And the hurdles, of course, that he and the author had to jump through to get it made. Yeah, Harry Harrison, lovely guy. I mean, you met Harry when he was in Australia, didn't you? But yeah, yeah, yeah. he was a wonderful person. He was, um, yeah. And the weird thing is, I've also met Charlton Heston. I went to a book signing and met Charlton Heston once um, mm-hmm. when his biography came out. And so I got to shake the hand that part of the Red Sea. It was quite a moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I can only imagine it's like his head would be three times bigger than ours. It know? wasn't. He, he had a normal. Imagine. He had a normal sized head. The weird oh. thing was, he had a very bad rug. His toupee was oh. um, challenged. Let's say I think that he was about due for a placement because you could see the weaving <laughs> underneath it. But uh, but apart from that, it was it was quite a moment to do that. Um, I'll give you one more clip too because I'm I'm playing with this machine. That I've got, it's yep. got the clips on it. I'm just enjoying it so much. Rosebud. Rosebud. Yes, yeah, so I've got my awesome Wells Rosebud clip in there. <laughs> and here's an obscure one. You know what this is, it's because I played it for you before. But for the people watching and listening, here's a clip from a classic science fiction film that doesn't get anywhere near enough love. This is the voice of world control. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Skynet. No, yep. that's uh, no <laughs> Colossus the Forbin Project, the original gangster Skynet from I think <laughs> 1969, 1970. Great film. Eric Braden, really? Susan Clark. Uh, yeah, about a couple of computers that take over the world. It's kind of way yeah. before its time. 
Absolutely. Marion Ross from um, uh, the yeah. mother from Happy Days. James in Hong's well in there too. James Hong's in there. Oh, of course. Yeah. He was in everything in the 1960s and 70s. He was a go to <laughs> Chinese American actor for a while there. If you needed somebody for a bit of ethnic diversity, you gave James Hong That's a couple it. of scenes. Yeah. Him or Key Luke. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Philip Arn as well. Philip Arn was the other one. Oh, that's right. Yes, he was in um, uh, Buck Rogers or the, the yeah. original Flash Gordon. One he of was them. also in one I Jax I talked about it in the last YouTube video. Ah, right. Yeah, so it's interesting okay. just to see the actors of um, non-white persuasion who turn up in so many films and just didn't get enough love and enough oxygen. Oh, uh, yes. Well, well uh, hopefully those days have changed. We don't see so many Hollywood films with Hollywood actors with mm. makeup on their eyes like we used. Yeah, um, the last one was, um, what was that one with Tom Hanks in it and all the other things? The um, I'm going to have to look it up now. So just um, you talk and tell me how wonderful you are for a little bit well, so while I find <laughs> Tom Hanks movie. <laughs> all right, now. I present the Schlocky Horror Picture Show, which is seen on community TV around Australia. Um, uh, it's screened on Sunday nights in Melbourne on Channel 31, mm -hmm. um, in Adelaide at midnight on Fridays, and on Aurora, Foxtel Aurora, which is seen nationwide. Now, all these stations have live free streams. So by all means, check out their website. Um, even the Foxtel Aurora site is uh, free streaming. So by all means, check them out. Yeah. Check out our show. Have a look at the Schlocky Horror Picture Show. Find me on Facebook if you can. Yep. And, Nigel um, Honeybone, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Nigel Honeybone and or the Schlocky Horror Picture Show. Yep. Yeah. It was Cloud Atlas. That's the movie where Tom Hanks and a whole bunch of other <sighs> white actors do Kind of, they're playing people in different parts of past and present and future history. And well, so yeah, I, I, there's a bit of an epicanthic fold there kind of thing. It doesn't look good, though. It's aged really badly since 2012, uh, which is <laughs> a horrible thing. A movie that ages badly in eight years is something to really worry about. Uh, it's interesting times we're living in with the Rona and all that, uh, as far as the movies that we want to see are coming out. Oh, no, that's right there, um either being held back or being released um, on streaming services. Yeah, mostly they're being held back, which is the bit that pisses me off. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, I want to see the new James Bond movie. I want to see The Eternals. I want to see all of the Marvel movies. I want to see Tenet, the new Christopher Nolan one, which has been indefinitely delayed. Uh, it's... They're being delayed because of the, the, the virus, as mm. you say, but... Um, I guess they're not being completed, or many of these projects aren't being completed because of the virus. Um, uh, I, uh, I usually work with my producers in one room. We haven't made any episodes for a while, of course, yeah. because of the virus and mm. other reasons. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I can understand why these films are being held back. Um, but <laughs> they'll be out eventually. Um I, I, the cinemas are open here in Sydney. They're very yep. open last month. Um, but I haven't been to any movies yet. The last movie I saw on the big screen was Knives Out. Right. That's how long ago it was. Yeah. How's, that, um, how's that been up for a brief moment as well? And I saw The Dark Knight because they didn't have any new movies to show, so they had The Dark Knight. Really? Yeah, I did a video about it. It was a kind of weird experience and not a comfortable one. And I know that a couple of my YouTube viewers didn't like the fact that I went back to the cinema. But uh, for the most part, it, uh, it was kind of sad but comforting in a weird way as well. It was, it was quite an unusual thing. Yeah. Well, I, well I, I, I would normally go to the movies on a Monday down at the Dendy mm. Cinema in Newtown. Yeah. And, um, and I'd usually go with a friend. Uh, my friend refuses to go out or, or, or um, expose herself mm. <laughs> to the disease. So, yeah, so to um, speak. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I sort of understand where she's coming from. So, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing a movie when it comes out. And, yes, Tenet looks great. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, interested. I to posted a trailer for that recently. Yeah, I really want to see that one because it, uh, there's some really interesting intellectual stuff. Of course, you've got Christopher Nolan saying it's not science fiction, it's not time travel, which is <laughs> um, not entirely true. 
I think no. I think I think he's <laughs> just got to kind of lean into it and embrace the fact that he's a genre director sometimes, and and kind of go with that. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to so many other things. There are a couple of interesting things coming out on streaming services. Um, I watched The Old Guard on Netflix. I'm not going to talk about that this time because I've actually got to do it on Wednesday for the ABC radio gig I do for ABC Darwin. So I yeah. don't want to take any oxygen away from that. I may well do a video about it afterwards. But what I tend to do is because the ABC, our national broadcaster here, are some, are, you know, they've been nice to me for 13 years and let me do this on a weekly basis talking about movies. Um, I want to respect that and put anything I do about a particular movie out to them first. And then maybe I'll backfill with a, with a YouTube video about it later sometimes. It's, um, it's a fun gig, but it's one that I've got to kind of be careful about and be respectful of. Of course. Yeah. And, and then, you know, who, I mean, what kind, what, you've got to love um, national broadcasters in that sense because they're the ones who let a guy who left school at 15 talk about and talk knowledgeably about movies on the radio <laughs> whereas you know i don't have a degree in anything <laughs> i don't um, i left school at 15 started working in factories for five years and and kind of moved on from there but they let me do it and they kind of respect the knowledge that i have gained and the people i've worked with have been uniformly wonderful well, well one exception maybe but uniform yeah for the most part really really nice people they've um they've suggested things they've thrown me for curves but they've been really supportive of my stuff, and I really oh, love yep. them for that. Yeah. Look, and I've known you uh, since the mid '80s, yeah. uh, going to conventions, etc. And I know you're a very knowledgeable. Person. I've always known you as a knowledgeable person. Well, thank you. Uh, particularly in this uh, uh, this um, branch. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, film and television in general. Uh, I, I, I just love chatting about it. Absolutely. Um, we, we did throw a curve last week on the radio because we did Hamilton. Um, oh, so, yeah. so we're doing our, like a hip-hop rap musical, which is way out of my comfort zone, but we actually got useful stuff out of it. It was an interesting oh. one to do. And uh, so, yeah, we talked about that. We talked about the other musicals that referenced and other things, and, and um, people loved it apparently. So, yeah, there you go. And now, I haven't seen the show. I, I'm familiar with the soundtrack, mm -hmm. some really catchy tunes, but um, I, I believe it's been screening on Disney um, Disney Plus yeah. recently. Yeah. And um, so, so is it a, like just a filming of the stage performance? Um, it's a, a filming of the stage performance, but it's incredibly well done. Uh, the direction on it, uh, directing uh, film stage performance is a difficult thing. It's really not the easiest thing in the world. But they did it in a way where, um, they, I mean, the, the level of detail they would have had to gone into to have cameras on the right person at the right time when people are throwing lines between each other all the way around the stage. Uh, and the stage is interesting too. They've got, like, galleries on three sides, so, like, tiered terraces above the thing on three sides. And they've got this double lazy Susan rotating floor, one within another. And so it's an incredibly complex stage thing. The lighting is... On, state of the art so it's really great and they've got to convey things like the revolutionary war and various duels and all sorts of things in there it really is next level stage stuff and then somebody's got to direct that and put it in a context that's meaningful for somebody watching it at home and they're not just filming a proscenium arch they're kind of cutting in and out and uh it's an immersive experience it uh, really i think in some ways it may well be slightly better than um people watching it uh, in an audience. No, well, you, you do want something special from it. A lot of people in the US have already seen Hamilton, apparently, so yeah. you need to make it look special. Yeah, well, well, I look forward to seeing a proper film version of it if it ever comes around. I'm not sure it'll actually work in that context. I don't think taking it out of the, off the stage will work. I mean, I'm sure Disney will, will try to do it, but there are just so many locations you'd have to do and, and so much different stuff and, and yeah you could do it all but i'm not sure the value added would be there to to do it as a kind of um out on location musical uh, mm. i don't think that would particularly work i think letting it be what it is and then having all the stage productions australia was going to get a stage production of hamilton but then the corona hit 
And so that's yeah. definitely on hold. But I think that because people have seen it on Disney+, Plus, they will go to see the stage show when it becomes available in this market. And I think it'll make the Boku bucks they're fully, they were fully expecting it to once the yeah. virus is dealt with and once people can gather in large numbers. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, uh, I've been told that, um, you know, the, the subject matter is relevant outside the USA, that people in other countries will still get it, even though it's about American politics. It's a lot about a lot more else. A, a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's about a lot more. Well, I, I did say it was like getting American history blasted at you with a fire hose. But, <laughs> but once, you, once you learn it, it's, it's, it's kind of good to that too. So um, anything else you've been watching lately? We'll get back to that because we've obviously digressed incredibly much. <laughs> Well, well, uh, you mentioned uh, Hamilton, of course. Now, mm. I, I remember seeing uh, uh, the the live stage version of Little Shop of Horrors, the musical, okay. yeah. and I, I thought the same thing. How is this going to work as a, a an actual film? Will mm. it work? Could it work? And well, the the the, the film that they made with uh, directed by Frank Oz, yeah, um, succeeded. It, it was able to pull that off. I'm. I'm not a big fan of the musical Little Shop of Horrors. It, for yeah. what it wants to do, it did fine. But mm. I, I still like the old Roger Corman Little Shop of Horrors. It, and it, it yeah, seems got, to me like they've taken out all the jokes. And also, the the humor. Is, also it's got that kind of street-level charm about it. The, the fact that it is a budget movie set in a poor part of a town kind of That's makes it, 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 makes it work in that way. Filmed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and well, yeah, so you know, so I, I do think the Frank Oz Little Shop of Horrors is uh, definitely a valid film, enjoyable. Yeah, it, it, I'm in two minds. Let okay. me just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those things where I mean, I like the I like the there are set numbers like Mean Green Mother from Outer Space. I like, and I like the yeah, they, I like the point of view shot from inside someone's mouth in, in the dentist song. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it's weird. Oh, your point of view shots. I'll, I'm going to digress again because it is my nature to do so. Yeah, no, you're sure. But the um, point of view shots. There's a point of view shot in the swarm from the point of view of the bees, and they actually do that oh. thing where they get all the little kind of bee-eyed, lots of little shots in there. And you oh, think no. you don't actually need to have a point of view shot from the bees' point of view. The bees <laughs> don't have a valid context in there. They're just. <laughs> We're not bees. trying to relate to them. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't need a B point of view shot in this kind of movie. Uh, you can convey it in other ways, but then Irwin Allen, for all of his success in various things, was a pretty shit director. And the other thing about The Swarm that I love to hate is that the dialogue is crazily bad. It's clumsy. It's clunky. It. I mean, people like Richard Widmark make a good shot of it, and Henry Fonda does as well. But Michael Caine's dialogue, the dialogue they put in his mouth, is incredibly bad. <laughs> and um, the, one of the, there's a there's a story about making that movie where he's he's on and Olivia de Havilland's died now, so we can tell the story. <laughs> Olivia de Havilland and Michael Caine are in the hills of Hollywood doing the filming for this movie, and um, she said, "Do you know that back in the day?" There was a hundred dollar bet between Errol Flynn and his mates on whether Errol Flynn could ever fuck me. And um, she then goes, "Okay, come over here." And she took Michael Caine to the place up in the hills where Errol Flynn got his way with her. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> she was a wicked lady. So all credit to her. And and Michael Caine said, oh, "I was shocked." She showed me where Errol Flynn and her had their liaison. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm probably going to have to bleep out the F word to put it on the YouTube oh. channel. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was... Um, uh, it was Errol like, Flynn. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah, Errol Flynn was problematic. These days he'd get cancelled because he did have a fondness for women who hadn't blown out too many birthday candles. Or and, girls, and, sorry, and, young and, women, no, children, yeah. And, of course, he was infamous. Um, uh, apparently he went to the universal makeup mm. person, Jack Pierce. Yeah. And his team and had them make a, a large rubber penis for him to wear, mm -hmm. and he would let it. He would wear it uh, under his robe and would let it slip out yeah. sometimes. Mm. And that's how he got this reputation of being well endowed. Yeah, 
So, yeah, very clever. I wonder how many other actors in Hollywood do that. Speaking of it's a mad, 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 mad world, do you know who um, was renowned for having the um, most profound equipment in Hollywood who was in it's a mad, 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 mad world? <laughs> um, um, no, I'm unsure. Milton no. Berle. <laughs> Milton Berle apparently a- um, had an elephant's trunk in his trousers. Oh, well, he was a tall man, wasn't he? Well, he wasn't that tall. <laughs> he, he was one of those people who says, yeah, well, mine's two inches long, but I measure from the ground up. <laughs> he was one of those kind of guys. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we've gone totally in a different direction here. So um, I'll, I'll let you know what I've been watching, and you can tell me what you think of what I've been watching. Let me just, oh, yes, yes. Um, I watched Dora and the Lost City of Gold, the Dora the Explorer live action movie. Ah, no, I've only, I've only seen photos from that. So. That's kind of fun. It's, it's on um, Prime at the moment, and it, it kind of worked for me, even though I'm not a fan of the source material, which I've never seen. It kind of works, and it was partly filmed in Australia, so you get Australian and New Zealand actors in there. Tamara Morrison, for instance, is playing one of the villains in the movie. Oh. And it kind of works, and um, there's... Some yeah, there's some good acting. It's uh, it's also got uh, Michael Pena in it, who was in Ant Man, um, and, and a few other people. Oh yeah, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a lot of fun to watch, and uh, I'll, I'm, I think I got more out of it than I expected to. It's just one of those kind of late night things. I'm not too tired yet. I'll try to find something on one of the streaming services to watch. So I went with that, and yeah, it's, it's entertaining as hell. You can you can often be surprised by some of these films. Um, I remember watching the live action Josie and the Pussycats. Uh, that was good. A film a film that I would not normally want to see, but I was caught on a bus <laughs> <laughs> traveling from Melbourne to Sydney, and mm. it was on. And wow, it just it had a sense of humour there I just never expected. Um, uh, uh, particularly the over-the-top um, promotions in there. The, uh, yeah, it's got Alan coming in it as well, which always knocks the movie up, up a notch or two. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so what else have I watched? Um, a couple of series I've been watching. First off, I watched um, some episodes of Stargirl, the um, Belanti vs. Oh. DC thing. Yes, I've heard about that thing. And that kind of works. Uh, it's got Luke Wilson in it playing her uh, Stargirl stepdad. It's got some nice heroes and villains in it, but I think it works. I think that um, there's some really cool bits. There's a bit right at the start where you get to see the Justice Society of America. You get characters like Wildcat and all of those guys in there, so (laughs) it's definitely got respect for the old-school DC stuff, and I think it may well work, so I'm enjoying that. Uh, Also started watching Season 2 of Doom Patrol, uh, now I haven't seen any of that yet. A friend is actually going to deliver me the first season soon, so I'm looking forward to Doom that. Doom Patrol works. Uh, I think there's a, a kind of it's starting to flag in the middle of the second season, but there's a story arc that I think has to pay off soon. But um, I kind of like it. I like the the screwed up superhero thing that they've got going there. Um, second season of The Boys is coming out soon too, which is going to. Oh, be I was nice. about to mention that I'm getting a, a, a copy of the first season again. I, yeah. I've only seen the first episode, so I'm looking forward to seeing the rest. Yeah, of that. so the second season uh, of that comes out at the end of the month, which I'm really looking forward to. So I've been watching a uh, bit of the superhero stuff. Also, been getting into Korean um, supernatural TV series, South Korean supernatural TV series. There's one called Mystic Pop Up Bar which is about a pop-up bar in South Korea, which helps people who are troubled by supernatural things, by ghosts and and other things like that, which is kind of fun. And I just started watching a similar one, because apparently this is a big kind of thematic thing in South Korean television. You know, really cute supernatural women who are powerful and scary at the same time (laughs) and who run run businesses. There's one called Hotel de Luna, which is about um, a hotel, which you can't really find unless you, you know, you're supernaturally aware, in Seoul, in South Korea, which helps ghosts move on. And there's a young man whose father sold him to the um, supernatural hotel to be the new concierge um, when he was a young kid. And so he finds out he's kind of obliged to help out this hotel 
and the first thing that happens is they make him able to see ghosts. So he's wandering through the streets of Seoul and suddenly he sees this woman with no eyes and it freaks him the hell out. Um, but they have a certain charm about them and they're usually based in Buddhist and Taoist kind of mythology. So they're, they're really um, a little bit interesting to watch and just a little bit out of the normal stuff you'd see. It, it's kind of worth checking those out if you get the opportunity. Well, yeah, I will. Um, I'll, I'll look that up. Mm. Um, so Del Luna, Hotel Del Hotel Luna. Hotel Del Luna and Mystic Pop-Up Bar. And it makes you want to kind of eat dumplings and, and drink soju and like <laughs> when you watch it. They really are kind of a, a lot of fun and uh, a lot of good uh, value there. Oh, well, I'll definitely look into those. Sure. Uh, what else? Uh, um, what We Do in the Shadows, have you been watching that? Yeah, I watched the um, the first season of that a little while ago, but I haven't seen any. Has the second season come out yet? Yeah, the second season is out. Mark Hamill makes an appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, Yes, uh, I've enjoyed that series a great deal. How is the second season of that? Um, uh, it's very good. Um, uh, it, the film was the breakthrough, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, um, yeah. But uh, Matt Berry is the star. He, he um, You'll know him from uh, English yeah. shows, uh, the IT crowd. Toast of London. Have you seen Toast of London with Matt Berry in it? Um, no. You got to see Toast oh, of London, where he plays plays an unsuccessful actor who mostly does voiceovers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is fantastic in that, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of transgressive as all hell, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's amazing. He gets a lot of work. He's a very funny actor, but hmm. he's a he's a character. He, he's always playing himself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Whether it be what in the, what we do in the shadows or uh, the Year of the Rabbit, I saw recently on the ABC. Um, it's a, a fun sort of detective yeah. series from a hundred, <laughs> oh, a couple of hundred years ago. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. He's just got that kind of persona that's going to work long term for his longevity as an actor. I think. Yeah, and and I remember him specifically. The first time I took notice of him was in Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Yeah, which, which has got a, to be something that's definitely in your kind of wheelhouse. <laughs> it's a deliberate schlock. Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly uh, preposterous. Yeah, it's a shame they didn't get to do a cameo in that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I've really enjoyed it uh, talking to you. Now, okay. is there uh, anything else you've been watching recently? Um, uh, uh, another series I've recently binged watched was Into the Badlands, which is... Um, I've heard there's a lot of good fight scenes in that. It's the best yeah. thing about it. Best fight choreography I've seen on any TV show ever. Cool. And um, by the way, um, there is some great stunt work on Stargirl as well. I, I did see a behind-the-scenes thing for that, um, which shows uh, there's, there's scenes of people climbing walls and then tumbling off them, and it was all done with wire work. So there's some really great um, stunt acting in that as well and, yeah. and it's made me appreciate that a lot of these superhero tv series and, and supernatural tv series live or die based on how good the stunt work is and the people doing it are definitely at cinematic you know like movie level stunt work for these series they really are doing some marvelous stuff on some very limited resources yeah um it was one of the things that disappointed me about the iron fist tv series um mm. The, the the action sequences weren't terribly action packed, if you know what I mean. Certainly compared to shows like Into the Badlands. Mm. Um, well, speaking of that series of DC series, um, uh, Iron Fist. Um, uh, that's uh, that's Marvel. Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Marvel. Yeah. Uh, uh, Daredevil, um, Iron Fist, mm-hmm. uh, Punisher. The action sequences are all seem very dark to me i mean like on tv it's it, mm. it you know it takes place in a tunnel or a dark hallway and it's very difficult to make out the fight sequences anyway i think that was i think daredevil talking got, about <laughs> sorry yeah uh, i think daredevil's oh, yeah. got great fight sequences i think the fight chore- choreography and that's next level but iron fist let it down a little bit the punisher um i like the punisher they're actually thinking of rebooting that using john bernthal again because he's just perfect in the role. So Marvel's actually looking at a way to bring that one back as a, as a new series because uh, it, yeah. it, it does have 
um, just great drama, a great character, well delivered, and uh, the fact that he is such a troubled and damaged person. I mean, the, the series made it clear in The Punisher that he does have some kind of acquired brain damage, which is limiting his ability to kind of anger manage in a sense. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of good stuff there. There's some really interesting things going on in that space. And uh, I think John Berthold committed to the role brilliantly oh, and, and he's it, got skills as an actor to really make it work. Perfect casting there. Uh, he was very good. That, he was from The Walking Dead, wasn't yeah. he? Amongst other things. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I'm, uh, he's... Uh, he's an actor I've seen do other things and, and do things that aren't anywhere near as intense and do them well as well. He, he's a rounded actor. He's just not um, a Johnny One note when it comes to that kind of thing. And uh, I kind of like that and I appreciate uh, how skilled he is at, at doing uh, various different kinds of roles. So every time I see him in something, I kind of go, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, John Bernthal's in it, I'll watch it because... He, uh, he's also got that lovely skill of playing off the person he's with. There are actors who are just waiting for their line, and you notice that. But John Bernthal, <laughs> is one of, he's got a particular gift that a lot of actors have, but he, I notice it w when I'm watching him that um, he's not just – he's listening and, and kind of he taking in what the other person – yeah, he, he's in the moment <laughs> with the other person. And I like that. I think it's just such a um, – as an actor, it's a generous thing to do because there are actors that aren't doing that. And, um, I mean, I watched, recently watched all the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies. And one of the things Tom Cruise is, does when other people are talking is he's reacting to them and, he, and it looks like he's listening to them, but he's looking at them and listening to them in such a way that it draws away from the other actor. Oh, okay. Um, and other people I'm may not. think differently. I mean, I, I respect other opinions on this, but I've noticed that kind of draws the attention to himself where it shouldn't, when it shouldn't be. And uh, I know that uh, in the first one, um, Brian De Palma, who directed it, deliberately didn't do too many two shots with Tom Cruise and other actors, and he deliberately cut away. And I think that that was to kind of limit that um, tendency of that particular actor yeah. to do that. No, I, 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 I think with the right material, Tom Cruise is terrific. Um, but he won't uh, do the right material. He wants to go for the big stuff. Oh, no, but little things like Tropic Thunder when he played the producer and that, that I think is one of his best roles. Yeah, that and um, Magnolia, they're the only two that I really like. I, mean, I like the Mission Impossible movies, everything about them except Tom Cruise. Exactly. I like Tom Cruise films, mm. but not because of him. Yeah. Um, he's been doing some great science fiction stuff recently. Um, and uh, even Minority Report, which is like 20-plus years ago, uh, it mm. still stands up. Yeah. But... Anybody could have played his role. Any um, competent actor, yeah. <laughs> I would have rather had Colin Farrell in his role than Tom Cruise. Yeah. You know, well, in that film. I mean, that, that you just made me think of something totally off, off beam here. <laughs> but um, I think for the YouTube channel, I might review the um, two Statham movies, uh, Crank. Crank 1 and 2. I think I might do a YouTube video reviewing Crank 1 and 2, because I think that they're among the best Jason Statham action films because they are just so off-the-wall crazy. Uh, crank yeah. and Crank High Voltage, they are. If you haven't seen them, um, they're just balls-to-the-wall action films. They're mad oh. and in the best way possible, and they're cut and delivered in an interesting way. So I think I'll save that. I'll keep that bullet in the chamber. And um, let me know, <laughs> people in the YouTube channel, let me know if you want me to want to see me do Crank and Crank High Voltage as a review because um, I'm fond of those films and I think I want to go and revisit them. <laughs> I've seen, uh, yeah, no, I haven't seen either of the films. I seem to remember the trailer for the first film. Um, yeah, no, it looks funny, but, yeah, he appears in other funny stuff as well. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think Statham's one of those guys who uh, could act better than he does. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of action film stars who are, are doing some solid acting. Um, Statham has done a couple of bits where he was kind of okay. Uh, the guy who's really transitioning from being an action actor to something a bit more serious these days is Dave Bautista. He's oh, doing yeah. some great oh. character roles, um, and and really kind of um, ramping it up. And uh, anything Batista is in, I'll watch. 
not only for the fact that he tends to swear at the American president on Twitter, but that's just an extra <laughs> thing to love him for. <laughs> no, he seems wonderful. I've seen him in the interviews and, of mm. course, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Uh, he, he has that – he's in one of those episodes of um, What We Do in the Shadows. Oh, cool. As well. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's in the first season. Okay. Um, there's a trial, and okay. there's a lot of guest stars in that episode. Yeah, including uh, Batista. He's in yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I just love him and what he does. I think that he did a thing called Bushwick, which is a, a kind of small, low-budget action film, filmed supposedly in real time. You know, like it was about an hour and a half in as something as things are happening in um, urban, suburban New York. And Bushwick mm-hmm. really is an interesting action film, and Dave Batista's character is really grounded and, and realistic and uh it's i think a bit of a hidden gem that people should check out if they get a possible uh the possibility of doing so i think it's really um one of the underrated action films and dramas of the last five or six years hmm. and um, and of course he was in uh, the blade runner sequel as well he was hmm. quietly disturbing in that too yeah absolutely um, he, he didn't um he didn't overplay it which is nice so he's got that ability to um uh, he's an intelligent guy and a, a very talented guy and i think that uh he uses that in interesting ways in the roles he chooses oh well hope for the best or, mm. or expect the worst yeah. for his career he, he um might uh, sadly he might end up just doing action films for the rest of his life, but I, I I hope not. I don't think so. I think even if he has to do his kind of smaller roles, I think he's aware enough of his career and aware enough of where he wants to go that there'll be some interesting things that here. And also with the streaming services opening up, there's the opportunities there. to Things don't have to be enormous $250 million budget blockbusters. Smaller films can be made and get an audience. And I think that Batista's career is going to play to that a lot more than uh, some other people's are. Absolutely. And the smaller films, of course, it's the, the, the names and the actors that really attract people to Absolutely. So we probably should wrap it up there because we've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes, allowing for breaks and interruptions. But yeah. uh, thank you, Nigel, for being on this. We should get you back at some stage and we'll talk about specific movies, I think. <laughs> well, that's it. Uh, that that would be a great idea. I'd love to talk again, mm-hmm. and yeah, we, we'll we'll start off with a few titles or subjects before we start talking. Yeah, because this was very much last minute, and I really appreciate you coming on board for it, mate. Oh, look, any time. Um, uh, d- during this dangerous virus, um, uh, there's very little for me to do besides. Well, I've got to do my laundry today. Oh um, well, thanks so- for sharing that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fashion is very important to me. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, yeah, but I mean, the clothes wear well on you, mate. You've you got the perfect form for wearing skinny jeans. <laughs> Bow ties are cool. <laughs> um, <Absolutely>. All right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that, mate. And I'll just um, kind of finish things by saying to the YouTube audience, uh, if you like this video and want to see more of this kind of content, consider subscribing and hitting the like button. And I'll post a link to Nigel's work because I really like it and I appreciate it and uh, we want to give him as much love as possible and in the meantime watch good movies watch bad movies watch all sorts of really bad science fiction movies and I'll catch you guys later seek out more independent films absolutely yes